Hanshon Shon's Paper Shon presents a little history of Ding Ding Religion, based on the book by Richard Holloway. Chapter Four: One and Too Many. Let's get started. So one day you hear your favorite author, I don't know, J.K. J.K. Rowling, Dave Pilkey, Dan Brown, I don't care who. So he's coming, or he, he or she's coming to town to talk about her work. So you go along to the bookshop where she's appearing and hear her reading for the new book, which is filled with the latest adventures of characters that are long familiar to you. You ask her where they all come from. Are they real? Do they exist somewhere? She laughs. Only in my imagination, she or he says, she made them all up. They come from her head, so she can do anything she likes with them. Well, what if it hits you on the way home that you might not be real either? That you might be someone else's creation, something like Neo from the Matrix, except you're not the hero. So, yeah, a character in a plot dreamed up by someone else. Were that to happen, it would be as if a character in a book came to realize that he or she had no independent life and was simply the product of some writer's imagination. Huh? That plot actually reminds me of a book. Hmm. Story seeds, actually, it reminds me of. So that was the idea that hit the sages of India with the force of revelation. They themselves were not real. Wait, what? Only one thing was real. And they called it the Universal Soul, or better yet, Brahman, which expressed or wrote itself in many forms. So everything in the world that appeared to exist in our reality was, in fact, an aspect of Brahman in the world. And Brahman in the world that appeared to exist, and in many disguises and shapes, it was as the Upanishads say, hidden in all beings, the self within all beings. Watching over all works, dwelling in all being, the witness, the perceiver, and the only one, and they were in Brahman, and Brahman was in them. What? Seriously, it reminds me of the Matrix. Is that where the plot came from? I mean, is that where Neo came from? And is that the one came from? Yeah, I watched the Matrix. It was on pretty young. But yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Anyway, let's just set aside all that. So, yeah, a story from the Upanishads captures the closeness of this identity in a famous phrase, which is said, "A father said to his son, 'Like those stick figures down there,' and he said, 'That which is the finest essence, this world has that as its soul, that is reality, and.'" Not art, though. Shivataketu. Well, this basically means that people may think they have a separate individual existence, but that is an illusion. They are all characters who appear again and again in Brahman's unfolding storyline, and their roles in the next episode are scripted by their karma. And it was not only individuals whose roles have been written for them, the way society has been organized into the different classes or castes. Had also been scripted, and every time a human soul was reborn, it found itself in and reincarnate found itself in one of these groups and had to live out its time there until its next death and reincarnation. Meaning the caste system was fixed. You can't buy your way up or throw away your riches way down. I, you can only. I guess you can only level down. I guess you can. You can't do anything else, really. Until you die, and you get bad karma, and you get good karma, then you get it. Unless you are a kidnapped king, then you might think originally before you were kidnapped, then you would think that you would have had good karma in your previous life. But then, after you realize you were kidnapped, you may have think that there was a lot of bad karma thrown into, well, more good karma, giving you the life that you wanted. But then, well, take all、oh, taking it away from you. Then you might consider if karma existed at all. But let's set this aside. The world with its cats and deficiencies and teeming forms of life was not the only way in which Brahman expressed himself. He created gods as well and men into them, and they were yet another way of the one without shape assumed in different shapes. This is getting really kind of confusing, guys. On the surface, Hinduism is polytheistic. Another way of saying. 
that you believe in many gods. But it could also be accurately described as monotheistic, because the many gods are all believed to be aspects or expressions of the one god. But even the idea of one god isn't quite right. And the Hindu belief behind this shifting illusion, characters who flipped through the life, including the god, Z, there is one supreme reality, the one thing, as the Upanishads expressed it. <coughs> if you'd like to learn technical terms for saying this belief, has to be known as monotheism, meaning one theism. Yeah, seriously. And so, one godism. Since not everyone has the kind of mind that's comfortable with the ideas, because that images of the gods as symbols of that one thing were made available to give people something to look at and concentrate on. Remember, a symbol is an object that stands for a connection to a big idea. To grasp the place of the three top gods in Hindu religion, Brahma the creator, whom we already met, and now we'll have to talk about... Well, Vishnu the Preceiver, but then also there's Ganesh, the dancing figure with three eyes and four arms, is Shiva the Destroyer, the elephant-headed god is Ganesh, one is Shiva's sons born to the goddess Parvati, and the four-armed woman holding the severed head is Kali, another of Shiva's wives. So Ganesh has the head of an elephant because one day his father failed to recognize him and chopped his head off. I realized his mistake, he promised him a transplant for the first creature he became a cross, which turned out to be an elephant. Well, as befits one who has endured such an ordeal, Ganesh is a popular and approachable deity who helps his followers meet the challenges life throws at them. But Kali's story is a bit less consoling, and there is no fishing and no replacing it with elephant heads. The gods in Hinduism are great shapeshifters, and Kali is one of the many forms of the mother goddess, the feminine aspect of God, in one of her battles against evil, Kali got so carried away with the spiritual destruction that she slaughtered everything in front of her. To stop her, the goddess, or is it God? It's a God. Anyways, to stop her, the god Shiva threw himself at her feet, which, which surprised her, and she stuck out her tongue in surprise. Kali and Gamish are colorful figures, but Shiva is more important. He's the most memorable of the triad of the top gods in the Hindu pantheon. And the other two being the Brahma, the creator, and whom we've already met, and Vishnu, the preserver. Well, finally, to grasp the places of these three top gods in Hindu religion, we have to understand two different ways of thinking about time. In the Western thought, time goes like an ar- arrow fired at a target, so its best image is a straight line, like, um, like this. In Indian thought, time turns like a wheel, so its better image is a circle, like this. Just as their karma propels individuals through the cycle after their cycle and after cycle of rebirth, so is the universe subject to a similar law. At the end of its present term, it fades into the void of emptiness, until that one thing starts the wheel of time spinning again, and Brahma brings another universe into existence. And then, Brahma's duty is done until the next turn of the wheel, so Brahma relaxes, and Vishnu, I don't know how to draw him here, so I'll just draw this, Vishnu takes out Vishnu, usually the victim of a maze in his right hand as a symbol of authority, let me draw that, symbol of authority, is the god who cherishes the world like a loving parent and works hard to keep it safe. So Vishnu is comforting and reassuring, maybe even a bit boring. Shiva is far from boring. He represents the warlike side of nature. He is the terminator who ends what Brahma started and Vishnu sustained. His most dramatic action is the dance of death. So I guess I should draw him with a skull. His most dramatic action is the dance of death, when he tramples time and the world back into oblivion until the next turn of the wheel. There is a way to salvation. And we'll talk about him next time. Hinduism does hold up the promise of final liberation from the wheel of time, but the sort of infinity of lives it may take to achieve salvation stuns the heart. Around 500 BCE, it prompted some to wonder whether there might not be a quicker way to obtain that longed-for release. It is the answer given by one of the most attractive geniuses in the history of religion, to which we can next turn. His name was Siddhartha Gautama, better known as... The Buddha. 
See you in the next episode, Prince to Buddha. Whew, it's been a long time making this video. Whew, it's worth it, though.